Welcome back to One Bology D1, the round of 16 with Callum and the Sottle. We're here to bring you another fabulous matchup. I don't know, it's a thing I'm trying. Uh, I maybe, like it. Maybe it should be like a theme with you and your, uh, your teammates because we are going to see one of your complexity teammates coming up in our next match here. We're going to see the Jor dude yes. going up against Sixo. A big matchup for him, of course, Sixo, one of the very best players in the world. Sono, what can you tell us about your teammate? Um, I can I can tell you many things. Um, you would you would not be wrong in saying that say Jordude is is one of the lesser known players in this format. But if uh, EU prelims taught us anything, it taught <laughs> us that that does not mean he is any less skilled than the players that uh, that we've heard of. Um, Jordude is a complexity player who uh, has a, a a reasonable size stream. He streams regularly. He's also been heavily involved uh, involved in uh, collegiate Hearthstone, I believe, in the Tespa tournament. That sort of thing, um, but his his high level tournament experience is is fairly limited at this point. So I'm sure he's very very excited and has worked extremely hard for this tournament. This could potentially be a big breakout performance for him if he's to do well. Absolutely, and we we'll see another one of your teammates in our next matchup, Ryzen, mm -hmm. uh, who again is a, a very similar player. Does stream a lot, not necessarily well known in competitive tournaments, and this could be a big opportunity for him. But I mean, what more can be said about Sixo, right? This is a guy who has won so many of these online invitationals. And of course, some offline tournaments as well did win the Esports Arena LAN towards the end of last year. Um, and has, but has, he does kind of struggle with, you know, he hasn't made it to BlizzCon and that was a, a bit of a sore spot for him. Hasn't won any kind of the major tournaments like ESLs and DreamHacks and stuff. He still almost seems like this kind of underground player that he was <laughs> back in the day when he was winning those small online cups and just grinding away at ladder yeah i mean i think i think sixo really came to most people's consciousness when he started hitting number one legend first every month yeah and it was the time when you know the times when he'd hit legend on one server hit number one legend on one server and then go and hit legend on the other server before anyone had dethroned him from number one right. on the other server and he did it. He was the first person to do it to help to hold number one legend across uh, Europe, Americas, and Asia at the same time. Correct. With a sea giant zoo, which of course has come back into popularity now, which is very interesting. But yeah, I think six more than anything, I think struggles with like a perception problem. There's like this this idea about six o that he hasn't really had major performances. He hasn't won major tournaments, but. If you actually like go to Liquipedia or something, for example, and look at his tournament record, the amount of like tournaments for five thousand dollars plus that he's won while you weren't paying attention is like enormous. Like his career prize money is a huge figure. He's won a ton of tournaments that were full of um, you know amazing players. Like you said, incredibly successful on ladder. He's able to kind of drag himself into top twenty legend basically at will whenever the hell he wants to, um, which is all just great testimony to him as a player. But you're right, I think there's this part of, of Sixo that he's also a very proud man, right? Like, he he thinks he's very good at the game, or to be fair, he knows he's very good at yeah. the game. And his um, his own ego and his own pride, like, he wants to just go out there and smash a DreamHack, smash BlizzCon, like, absolutely tear people apart and prove that he's the best player. Um, and he definitely has uh, some strong opinions on the things that stand in his way of doing that. Yeah, I, th I think he's one of the first who... Is really frustrated by the variance of Hearthstone because he know, like he says, you know, in his head he is good enough to win any tournament he's in. So whenever he loses a tournament, that's always you know a sore spot for him. But yeah, you, you know, you mentioned some of the tournaments we won. We were together for the HS Arena uh, Invitational that he right. won, uh, which was neither in arena or an invitational. Um, <laughs> he won the Esports Arena Invitational as well. Arena Invitationals, he's good at those. Uh, the We Play Hearthstone League as well, which was a, a longer tournament, not even just like a single elimination tournament like we were discussing. Uh, you know, he doesn't just win in these high variance formats. He also wins, you know, HS Arena was a, a group tournament as well. And he also won the uh, the Scan Hearthstone Invitational, the Root Gaming Hearthstone Invitational. He does love a good Invitational. And this is uh, very much in his wheelhouse here. We have the, uh, the classes here for you and the bands as well. A little bit smoother than last time, I'm pleased to say. We talked about good rogue players early on bringing rogue to tournaments. So I definitely put Sixo in that in that bracket of being a, a top rogue player. And he has brought it to the tournament here, along with Warlock and Warrior. Uh, speaking of favorite decks of Sixo, very good chance that's a patron warrior. And on the side of the Jor dude, of course, his Druid is banned Sixo. Uh, the Jor dude has Mage, Warlock, and Druid with his Warrior band. Hmm, interesting. 
interesting stuff. So 6-0 chose to ban out the warrior here, which I guess makes a decent amount of sense. If he's playing patron and oil rogue, which you've just discussed is very, very likely knowing 6-0's competitive history, then something like control warrior would definitely have a good chance of stomping on that. Um, Jordu choosing to ban out the druid kind of suggests that he is packing a control warrior. Maybe we're looking at the control warrior, control warlock, freeze mage lineup and he's just auto-banning Druid in every game. That's definitely a line that you can take if you just want to be consistent in your ban strategies. Because um, Druid is kind of the only deck that covers all three of those picks in terms of bad matchups. So just picking those three and banning Druid will put you in a decent position most of the time. Um, but I think 6-0 will be reasonably happy to see his Druid go, go down, having banned the Warrior, which is probably the one deck he suspects he would need that Druid for. Yeah, absolutely. And if you have the, the zoo as well on the warlock, the warrior ban makes quite a lot of sense. So, you, you know, if you if you've left yourself with patron, oil rogue, and zoo, that feels pretty good. Uh, you know, the, 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 those are all decks which struck which can struggle against control warrior. So a fair ban for you there. Um, can you tell us anything about Jordan's playstyle or anything like that? Any decks that he particularly favors? Um, not particularly, to be honest. I've seen him play a, a wide range of stuff. I followed him in the um, team league that we were a part of, um, where the, the team was uh, him, Ryzen... No, it was him... Yeah, no, it was him, Ryzen, and Wofster, with JJ subbing in every now and again. And throughout that, he played a decent range of decks, so he doesn't really seem like a, a class specialist to me. He's someone that kind of just picks what he thinks is strong for each individual tournament, and uh, will play them to, to a good level, so... Uh, no real indicators. Don't want to give away too much information. Maybe he gets to conceal all his decks here as well and just three O's with his first pick. So don't want to give away any information unnecessarily here. Oh, there you go. Being, being a bit cagey as a teammate there. But uh, yeah, I mean, as you say, it would make sense to maybe be playing the Freeze Mage, the Control Warlock. Uh, we're going to see the Rogue for 6 0. Another player opening up with the Rogue. Looks like an Oil Rogue and a fairly standard looking Druid, albeit very shiny from the Jordan. It is a very shiny, glossy looking druid. Uh, Living Roots, Emperor and Big Game Hunter, not the greatest of early mulligans against Rogue. Living Roots, fantastic card to have in your opening hand in pretty much every matchup, but against Rogue, a little bit diminished value because of how weakly it interacts with the hero power, but he's just going to choose to keep it in his hand, doesn't really want to draw it later, and uh, well, we're set for turn seven, Callum. That's about what we can say about that. Happens. Yeah, I was gonna say. Well, you've uh, you know you've drawn the living roots, which you, as you say is a, a great card to have in turn one, and you, you've got the combo, which is your finisher. And I guess all you got to do now is fill in the blanks, right? Yeah, we saw um, Life Coach do this to relative success in the Class Legends tournament that I casted recently, where um, on more than one occasion he dumped his entire hand into just one big ramp play. Um, I think we saw like Wild Growth innovate Darnus's Aspirant to like empty his hand at the start of one game or something like that. And um, then another another game, it was just like Wild Growth into like innovate, innovate Doctor Boom, Living Roots or something. Just dumped his whole hand again, and then he just kept ripping like Shredder off the top with four mana, Emperor off the top with six mana, Ancient of Lore off the top with seven mana. It's a thing that Druid can do for sure. And straight away, there you go. You see the Pilot Shredder from Jaw Dude starts to make this hand look a whole lot more promising. Yeah, it doesn't go for the Innovate Shredder, though. He doesn't believe, Callum. He doesn't believe in his deck. That shade is there as the next card. He just had to believe in it. But no, he's going to he's gonna pass it up. Looks like by keeping the Innovate, basically any card he draws gives him a curve. So yeah, the Azidrake here, for example, <laughs> lets him oh. play the Innovate curve. Druid of the Claw would have done the same thing. If he'd have picked up Emperor, he then would have had the curve of Pilot Shredder into Emperor. So keeping the Innovate at that turn actually gives you a lot more flexibility overall. Well, there's a second savage where we're talking about innervates. That could be a potentially a lot of damage coming in for, sec for, for Jordu here. The double savage, of course, which I believe is 21? 22. 22, sorry, yes. So he picks up an innervate. That would be uh, a lot of damage to be able to finish this game with. But there's there's Dr. Boom as well. So some pretty good cards being drawn by Jordu. He'd like to pick up a, a five drop for next turn, smooth out his curve. But what are things looking like for 6 over here? Yeah, not bad. He had the backstab SI turn on the previous turn. Those are the big turns you're looking for. The the Violet Teacher prep turns, Azure Drake prep, you know, SI agent turns. Things where you remove a minion and play a minion at the same time. That's what Druid really struggles to deal with in this matchup. So starting things out with the backstab SI was really nice for him. He can now follow that up to have a nice competitive board against this Shredder with the Farseer. 
Uh, but from this point, he's kind of uh, running out of proactivity in his hands. He's just sat on answers. So I wouldn't be at all surprised to see some sort of answer come out here. Like Deadly Poison would be the dream draw here, I think. Shade, not a terrible pickup for Jordan here on the Druid site, and the... Oh, never mind. That is better than Deadly Poison by an order of magnitude. I forgot Blood Mage existed for a second. Wow. And there's a Tomb Pillager as well, which is nice to be able to control the board. You know, if Jordan doesn't pick something up here... No, doesn't pick up a minion he can play. So the best he can do is swipe this board, and then Sixo has... Uh, a Tomb Pillager to start building up a board on his own side. Yep, Tomb Pillager and load up a dagger here. I was going to say, he's drawing a fair few cards before his next turn. So he's going to draw two here, one off the Blood Mage, one naturally. Then he's going to play his Pillager and he's going to get another card draw the next turn. So he had plenty of turns to pick up a weapon buff for those Blade Flurries that he has in hand. Um, so having immediately now picked up that Tinker's Oil, he's looking in decent shape, but as we mentioned in the previous Rogue game, there are uh, many nightmares about the card Dr. Boom has by Rogues here, and it often just demands a Blade Flurry on its own a lot of the time. And it's actually not too far off potential lethal for Sixo, right? Because he has the, the Tinkers and the Blade Flurry, so he can build that up. Uh, so coin a this face, and then there is 6 damage, that's 10. Tinker's Oil adds 6, 16, and then Flurry is 20 damage, I believe. Yeah, so not not too far off. And if we were, if we were to pick up something like a second Tinker's, there'd be yeah. a lot of potential. Well, you could play all that in one turn. Well, you can play the Eviscerate. Right. You could do double Tinker's Blade Flurry. Yeah. Um, he could actually work the prep in this turn, so he actually has 22 as well. He could cast the SI agent as well, but still not enough. But the SI is definitely a, an appealing looking option here to help deal with that Dr. Boom. But the problem with it right now is that you don't have anything too appealing to combo with it. A um, lot of options here. It looks like we're going to see the Blade Flurry turn come down here and then Eviscerate SI7 agent to take out the Dr. Boom. Oh, the four damage. <laughs> The four damage to the Tomb Pillager is brutal for six over. Yeah, that's that's pretty nasty. Not even like a three and one or two and two, just a straight four, and then some more damage to the face. Um, I mean, I'm I'm all on board for Druid of the Claw Savage Raw Face this turn. I don't know about you, Callum, but I'm looking at what my hand does right now, and it feels like Druid of the Claw Savage Raw progresses the game forward in my favor the best. I mean, it's certainly a uh, it's a gutsy play, but yeah, I, yeah, that looks like what Jordan is going for. I mean, sure, when you've got combo in hand and it's coming up to turn nine and it would give you lethal, yeah, definitely, definitely a play. So hold on, just a minute. That is four damage, six damage, twelve damage, eighteen, I believe. That's so close. Cast it all with the prep. Uh, wouldn't even need the prep, in fact. He has enough mana anyway. But I believe he's two damage short. So yeah, Sixo is gonna struggle with his options here, but he's gonna unfortunately come to the conclusion that he's about to get druided. Yeah, and this is the sort of situation where if this was conquest, you might see Sixo concede here. Yeah, look at his, looking at his face. He knows exactly what's about to happen. And uh, Sixo has been vocal in his hatred of the druid combo. Yeah, he's just going to go for it here with the, the Deadly Poison and the Oil and do as much damage as possible, but isn't going to be enough. Nope. Uh, puts himself on the win next turn with the second Flurry, but it's the best he can do. Keeps his 6-3 on board as well, but he's going to get the unfortunate news. I'm sure he knows deep down in his soul exactly what that Druid of the Claw, Savage Raw face meant for his uh, prospects in this game. <laughs> Doesn't even wait for the Savage Raw to get played. Get play. Just respects the fact he has it, concedes the game, and 1-0 to the Jaw Dude. Druid things. There we yep. go for the Jaw Dude. He does jump out to a 1-0 lead and does get to keep his Druid, and it's something you, that can happen in last year's standing, and it's fair to say it can. It definitely can happen, and we will more than likely see it a couple of times, is that last year's standing, one deck can just dominate and blow out a series, and it's not always the most entertaining thing to see, and that was part, really... The criticism of that was the main reason for Conquest being yes. brought in instead. Yeah. Absolutely. It can happen. I mean, 
we have mostly kind of evangelized the merits of Last Hero Standing during this broadcast, but there is an element of, of greener really? pastures to we've, that. We've evangelized the format of the tournament in which yeah, yeah, we yeah, got exactly. on to broadcast? Right. Funny. But there is an element of greener pastures to that, right? In that, you know, we miss the thing that we don't have and we don't like the thing that we have at the moment. You know, we tend to remember the days of Last Hero Standing with slightly rose-tinted glasses on, but there was always that feeling of that one dominant deck in the meta, you know, be it um, you know, Sunshine Hunter, Miracle Rogue, whatever it was at the time, these things Handlock just... Handlock with Handlock, uh, Leroy yeah, Faceless. Exactly. These things just had the potential to just crush series after series, and you just saw 3-0, 3-0, 3-0. You know, you, you win the mirror against the OP deck from your opponent, and then you're just in such a good position. So that for sure is the downside of Last Hero Standing. And Druid definitely top of the list of contenders to be able to do that kind of thing. Well, the first World Championship final was, of course, held on the last year of standing. Firebat won that 3-0 to zero in around 40 minutes Yeah. To, with Druid to win the World Championships. But yeah, it, it definitely can happen. I do feel like the meta is in a bit of a healthier place for last year of standing now I agree. Than, yeah, I, I, than in those days. Because, you know, you're seeing a lot of varied lineups. You'd be very hard. I mean, in those days, it was very likely that most players were bringing a very similar lineup. There were basically, you know, maybe four decks. There were usually two really good decks and two good decks yeah and everyone would bring the two really good decks and one of the good decks and it was all the same right now you're seeing complete variety in the lineups that, uh, that we play in you know it's, it's something of a cliche and it's something a lot of people have said but it feels like the the meta variety of hearthstone is in as good a place now as it's ever been um you can you can definitely make that statement callum but i'll, I'll let it lie for now and we'll get on to the game <laughs> six o has uh taken Zoo into the Druid here, which is no great surprise. Classically, a very, very good matchup. Um, there was a period where Druid started to fight back in this matchup when the Zoos tilted themselves towards the, the Void Caller Malganis package and slowed themselves down a little bit. That gave Druid a bit more time to get value out of their mid range cards. Um, but now it's been tuned back to this quicker list with more one drops, more buffs, etc. Um, Zoo finds itself in a really, really strong position against Druid most of the time. Yeah, I mean, looking at this lineup from 6-0, obviously we haven't seen what the, the fourth deck was, the, the Druid, but you can assume it was a fairly standard Druid. He's really gone to his comfort picks here. The Patron, the Zoo, and the Rogue are uh, kind of the decks that you would expect to see from 6-0. Traditionally, you know, decks that he's laddered with, decks that he's played a lot of tournaments with. Uh, interesting to see that he has just picked all the decks that you would maybe predict from 6-0. I'm interested as to Sixo's positioning of the Imp Gang boss here, putting it on the right hand side of his board. He has the Direwolf in hand, and your consideration with Imp Gang boss a lot of the time when you have Direwolf is where you want the 1 1 Imps to spawn. Because that's what you're going to be using most of the time with the Direwolf to trade. Um, so, Conventional Wisdom usually says that you want it on the left hand side of your board so that the Imps spawn to the right and then get to share the buffs with your other minions. Whereas this way, the Imps will just kind of get spawned over to the right hand side on their own. Um, so interesting as to why he chose to position it there, but I'm sure Sixo has a, a reason for it because, as we've mentioned before, he's a he's a guy that I've seen be very very critical of people playing Zoo in particular. It's one of the decks I've seen him criticise the most in terms of people not understanding the minion positioning and the little intricacies of the deck. Um, so yeah, interesting to see him go with this line. Yep, and has the Ruby Neg able to trade with the Shredder here, which is pretty good. Oh, there's a Dark Peddler. First one of the game, but on the not on the warlock side. All right. And just a complete board flood strategy here from Six O has only a power overwhelming left in hand. But uh, I mean, that is one of the problems with Druid is that there's no really clean AOE. Swipe can only do so much, and against a board like this, you have three minions with health above one, and you have a divine shield minion. So. How much can you really do? You could clear half of this. Yeah, and on top of that, you have a minion that spawns minions on sources of damage, which makes the whole thing even more complicated. So, yeah, as you said, swipe is very rarely perfect, and also in this matchup, as we mentioned before, you, you kind of always get a situation where, oh, hey, this is a nice swipe, I'm going to swipe, and then your opponent immediately has the implosion straight afterwards to follow it up. So it's a very, very hard situation to get consistent value out of swipe with druid but having said that it's still one of the cards that you really do want to draw in this matchup yeah, jordan hasn't managed to draw it instead just going to play a taunt and there is the implosion that we were just talking about if the swipe had come down 
Yep, uh, not surprised to see that passed up though. He doesn't really have room on the board for it. He'd have to trade in a bunch of stuff to get value that way. So it doesn't really make too much sense to sacrifice it. He's just going to take the really clean trade with the power overwhelming. Taps into the creeper, which is perfect for his mana usage. And uh, we saw Druid defeat Zoo in our first series, but this is looking much more like the standard thing that we expect of uh, Zoo getting onto the board early, being able to use those efficient buffs to bust through the one minion a turn that Druid can play, and just swarming the board in this nature that Druid just can't compete with. Yeah, I mean, this is classic Zoo, swarming the board with so many minions that just can't be dealt with are really hard to, to handle. And this is something that when Zoo was very popular was happening to, uh, to I think, all of us on ladder on a fairly regular <laughs> basis. Um, one thing I did, did want to mention briefly from Six of the Argent Squire in the deck, uh, one drops are a source of much contention among pros who do favor the the type of pros who really play the the hunter, the face hunter, and the zoo decks are often debating which one drops are the best. Uh, Argent Squire, Worgen Infiltrator, etc., etc. Yeah, even even Flame Imp is a consideration to cut from Zoo at points because if the meta's aggressive, it can be just such a horrible draw later in the game. And even at the best of times, you know. Flame Imp just trades badly against a shielded minibot, for example. It trades really badly against a Lepinome. You get into, you get yourself into these situations where the three two stats for one mana just don't end up being that effective. Um, but the the matchups where you really do love Flame Imps early are these kind of matchups where you just want to beat up on your mid range opponent. So uh, Sixo snapped the Finley Murgleton off the Dark Peddler, and has ended up with the heal here. Yeah, he he, uh, he picked. Finley because Hunter Hero Power would have been lethal, so it was an out just to win the game this turn, but unfortunately he didn't pick it up, so he's just going to go ahead and uh, take the heal, which is pretty awesome in this situation, honestly. Like, Hunter would yeah. have ended the game, but the Priest Hero Power with this much board control is arguably the best Hero Power in the game. Unfortunately, when you don't have board control, it's arguably the worst Hero Power in the game, and such is the problem of Priest, but uh, in this situation, when you have a bunch of targets, it's a fantastic answer to play around Spike just a little bit more, and that is going to be enough for 6-0 to level up the series. One to one, absolutely, the score between 6-0 and Jordude. 6-0 will, of course, keep playing the Zoo, and uh, what does the Jordude have left? Uh, so Jordud has used his Druid, which means he is left with Warlock his and Mage. Warlock and Mage with his Warrior Band, yeah. Yeah, okay. And, uh, I mean, depend I guess if, if his Warlock is... There's, there's so many different options here for what these decks are, and it basically, it could be either way around, depending on what version these decks are, right? You don't yep. want to necessarily pick Zoo into Zoo. Unless you're playing something that you don't feel, you know, if you don't feel like the Freeze Mage, for example, is good against the Zoo, you might want to pick the Mirror Match, but who knows what you're playing. I don't know who out there doesn't feel like Freeze Mage is good against Zoo, Callum. I don't know. True. I don't, I don't know where those people are, but yeah, it looks like Jordude is going with Mage here, um, which suggests that it is a Freeze Mage, because um, although we've just said Freeze Mage very, very effective against Zoo, Tempo Mage, not so much so, because... Nerubian Egg almost on its own can win that matchup <laughs> for Zoo. It's just a horrible card for Tempo Mage to deal with. Bus Mirror Entity, Flame Waker, Arcane Missiles, Flame Cannon, all this stuff. It's just miserable against Egg. So I would suspect this is a Freeze Mage coming out here from Jordude. Yeah, I would be very surprised if that's not what we're seeing. From the indication from the lineup as well as the, uh, the matchup as well against the Zoo. So we are about to get into the game here. It is the mage, role-player mage from Jordude. Has that, that sweet Medivh going on, and yup, straight away we see that it is the Freeze Mage. So Freeze Mage, one of the most effective decks at tearing apart what Zoo wants to do, um, primarily because Zoo is so board-focused, right? So many of their cards need stuff in play to be active. So your Abusives, your Dark Iron Dwarfs, your Defender of Argus, these things get um, buffed exponentially in value when there is a minion on the board ready to attack. And Freeze Mage is great not only at clearing boards, but at just freezing them out and locking them out, which makes cards like Abusive Sergeant, Dark Iron Dwarf, Power Overwhelming useless. Gormok the Unpaler. Thoughts? Good card. Those, yeah. those are my thoughts. Um, I was I was a naysayer for the longest time as well, but I have come around to it. Um, I actually did some win rate testing on Zoo with uh, Gormok versus Dark Iron Dwarf and Shredder. 
And for me, Gorm Gormok came out way, way ahead. Um, you have to be prepared, I will say this, if you have it in your deck, to play it as a 4-4. Mm -hmm. Like, not activate it. Like, take the Greed. The same way you would with Dark Iron Dwarf a lot of the time. You know, a lot of the time you'll play Dark Iron Dwarf not to really pick up a nice trade, but you'll just push two extra damage to face with a minion with it just to get the 4-4 in play. Just think of it like that, but you miss two damage, and occasionally it will just win you the game. That's a pretty good card. Yeah, well, we talked earlier about Freeze Mage a little bit when Freeze Mage wasn't being played. Uh, I was talking about Face Hunter, but yeah. we did mention Freeze Mage uh, and the phases of the Freeze Mage game. Uh, and the draw phase, of course, being the first thing that the Jordan is looking to do. Double Arcane Intellect and Acolyte of Pain definitely does give them that, those options. So, yeah, the Acolyte of Pain, a pretty easy decision here. Frost Nova might be tempting to stall out the board, but no, that's not the play. You want to just draw and be very patient and see what you can get together here, but <laughs> Gormok to face. Straight away. It only took until turn four until you see that this card is just significantly better than Dark Iron Dwarf. No, I'm kidding. So it dealt four damage that turn, whereas Dark Iron Dwarf would have, would have dealt two, but the important thing is like both cards would have been played there, and that's kind of the situation that you're expecting. What you have to acknowledge when you put these cards in your deck is that their value on the board as a 4-4 four -four is often um, more of a consideration than what they do. So when they do do something, you might as well have the more powerful effect in Gormok in your deck. Yeah, this is looking pretty rough for Jordude, honestly, because that Sea Giant is sitting at 5 mana, and it's coming up to turn 5. So, yeah, he's, he's just going to use the Ice Lance to freeze wow. the Gormok, and actually, the Sea Giant is going to be completely playable this turn. Yeah, Sixo may be considering whether he wants to play that Sea Giant, though, because he will be considering that he's about to go into turn five, which is one of the big alarm bell turns that you come up against against Freeze yeah. Mage. It's the potential of Frost Nova Doomsayer. And if that were to come out, you would see that there's no possible answer to the Doomsayer, so he would immediately lose one of his highest value cards in the Sea Giant. And so, yeah, this is a very strong play here from 6 -0. He chooses not to push all in here, recognizes that he's in an excellent position already. He will force the Frost Nova Doomsayer, if it's in the hand, on this board, and then he can just begin to refill afterwards. One of the things that I think is a really underrated part of Freeze Mage is, is something that maybe people don't appreciate as one of the reasons why the deck is so strong, is having that mid-game three-turn stint, where if you've drawn as what, you know, you want to draw in the early turns, and if you've drawn a lot, there's a really good chance you can have at least two of Frost Nova Doomsayer, Blizzard, and Flame Strike. Right. And having the ability to just devastate your opponent's board, sometimes three turns in a row, mm -hmm. is a really, really powerful part of Freeze Mage and what makes it so good. I want to touch on the Novice Engineer as well, because we were talking about the Asian meta a little while ago. Uh, very popular in China, no Novice Engineer. You would see in a standard Freeze Mage, no Loot Hoarder, double Novice Engineer, uh, pretty much universally. Yeah, I'm starting to come around to the Novice Engineer plan as well. Um, what it does is it's, it's a little bit weaker in the early game because of the, the lesser stats. It's not going to trade very well on the board. You know, sometimes you'll just get to take out a Knife Juggler with a Loot Hoarder, for example. Um, but what it does is in the late game where you need that immediate cycle, you know, how many times have we seen a Freeze Mage game be like, oh god, he needs to draw something right now, and they have to play like Loot Hoarder and ping it for four mana to get their draw. Whereas Novice Engineer has that immediacy, so you can just rip the card that you need with more man with more total mana available to you. Yeah, definitely. Double Sea Giant from six on the deck. Uh, so again, has the option to play one, but decides against it. Instead of going for the Knife Juggler Implosion. I mean, Knife Juggler Implosion's pretty good. So, yep. yes, that's an okay decision. Yep, and he's just going to cross his fingers for no additional board clear here from the Jaw Dude and hope that his Sea Giants can start getting the party started this turn. But um, I like the sequencing from 6 -0 there. He believed in the fact that the board was going to be cleared and he just attacked his 1 1 to face before he propped the secret. Um, the important thing being, if he'd have given the Ice Barrier to his opponent off the, ma off the Mad Scientist and then propped it with the, uh, with the Spider then a second Ice Barrier would have been playable from hand this turn. Whereas if you leave the Ice Barrier unactivated, that yep. locks out one of their potential options. And we can see the secret that came off the Scientist was an Ice Block. Yes. And the Barrier did come into hand. And it looks like I'm going to see the Barrier here. Yep, so Block and Barrier are both in play right now. Again, apologies for the, the lack of secrets. You can just about see the Barrier poking out there from underneath the hand. Two secrets in play, Block and Barrier both up. Um, but it may be time now to get the uh, the Sea Giant party started. 
Hey, Elven Arch is not bad. Does one damage to face. Yep, and it's playable for free here. Obviously, he has the mana to play it alongside a five mana Sea Giant anyway, but on a Sea Giant turn, a one drop is always free to develop anyway. Um, obviously, one mana to play just discounts your Sea Giant by one. So. Yeah, Dog Peddler into the Sea Giant uh, having the one drop is pretty great. It may concern. He's actually thinking here. I think he's already attacked with all his minions, which suggests that Elven Archer is going to go into the Novice Engineer, but. It's not a bad thing just to have from hand against a freeze mage. Right. If, if, you, get... if you put them to one damage and right. then they can clear the board thinking you've not got any direct damage. Yeah. It's, it's actually could potentially be a, a winning card against freeze mage. But yeah, he did attack with all his minions initially, which means that the uh, the Elven Archer was almost always going to be used to clear out that 1-1. And the second Doomsayer top deck here is enormous for Jaw Dude. Arcane Intellect fits the curve perfectly. And no doubt in my mind, we are seeing Frost Nova Doomsayer come out this turn. Yep, and there's the Blizzard to back it up as well. So even if a board comes down the next turn, you can just freeze it completely and do some damage to it while picking up things like your, your Fireballs, as you can see, the Forgotten Torch, the Pyroblast is there, which is a card that some players cycle out with Freeze Mage, some players, like, uh, it effectively takes up another flex slot, but for some people it's... It, it depends on your opinion. Some people think it is a core card and you can't cut it. Mm -hmm. uh, and some people always play it in Freeze Mage, whereas some people like to cut it in favor of another flex slot. So right. it gives them the ability to put in an extra draw or put in an extra heal or an extra freeze or something like that. Right. And Sixo here, I'm sure, will silence his Sea Giant. Yeah. Yes. So many, many people in this situation make the mistake of just silencing the 0 7 and leave it on the board. Most of the time it has zero effect on the game, but. It is strictly better just to get the silence minion, to get the 07 off the board, because there are things that can happen to a silent 07, like boom bots hitting them, for example, if that's yeah. in your deck. So. Or you could somehow get a, an abusive sergeant in this freeze mage. <laughs> right, yeah. Un unstable portal in freeze mage for some reason into abusive sergeant. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, pretty bad unstable portal, but yeah. sure. Law Walker Cho drops off a shredder and you cast power over. Like, these are all things that can happen. Yeah, just avoid even the craziest things happening in Hearthstone because they very all, often do. <laughs> as I say, we've all watched esports. We know how it works. Yeah, we've only had one official esports moment today so far. But I'm sure it's coming. Uh, so it looks very much like Jaw Dude has evaluated his hand here and decided he has enough turns to burn out the game, which in fact he does. Yeah. Uh, with the second ice block in hand, the fireball ping next turn will put him down to ten and then the follow-up with the Pyroblast, and Sixo has filled his board here. He was forced to do it on his last turn. He had to play the Owl. There was no consideration about it. He had to. So his consideration for this situation had to come two turns out, which is where the Elven Archer play comes in, mm -hmm. because he didn't have to play that Elven Archer. He could have chosen to take one less damage, cleared out the 1-1 with one of his 1-1s, kept the Elven Archer in hand for like a guaranteed kill at the end of the game. Um, and then had one space on his board now in this situation so that he could play Lotho. Yeah, unfortunately, that is going to be the end of this game. Not being able to play his Lotheb here or is going to really cost him. Ice put... block is popped, but unless he finds some way to remove a minion from his board here, he's going to find himself in trouble, and he's just going to pass. He's not even going to try for it. I guess there's no option in his deck to do that. Uh, yeah, does he not have... Would power overwhelming not do it? No, because it doesn't die until you hit end turn. Yeah, sure, so sure, yeah. Able... Turn. Yep, so there's there's no option for him to be able to remove a board, and I think that loss for Sixo does really come down to that decision to play the Elven Archer. I'm like I'm not gonna go as far as to call that a misplay because that's a that's a long way out you have to predict, right? You're, yeah. You're sacrificing one damage that turn, you're sacrificing one of your one ones getting lost off the board, and you don't develop an additional one one. For the cost of that you have to be reading two turns out that if your opponent casts their one remaining copy of Frost Nova and their one remaining copy of Doomsayer, you will then have to fill the board with Iron Beak Owl to play around that. Yeah. That I mean, that's a lot of stuff going on, but I think like that's the play that lost him the game at the end of the day. Yeah, absolutely. Some forward thinking that was just almost impossible for Sixo to, to be able to anticipate that kind of play. Yeah. Uh, but as I say, it did cost him the game. And the Freeze Mage doing Freeze Mage things I know a lot of people are very anti-Freeze Mage, and I can see why it uh, does the fun and interactive meme doesn't necessarily uh, apply to Freeze Mage. But Sixo, of course, 
Uh, Knight moves on to his warrior, which is likely to be Patron. I would be very suspicious of the Patron Warrior, yeah. Um, obviously, 6-0 notorious as a Patron Warrior, more so than anything else. And even more so, a lot of players just feel like Control Warrior isn't particularly strong right now. Um, more so in Conquest, I've heard, than, than Last Hero Standing. But uh, I would be shocked if we see a, a Control Warrior come out from a 6-0 here. I would be... Uh, very, very suspicious of the Patron Warrior. So it looks like we're going to have Patron Warrior into Freeze Mage here, which is uh, an interesting matchup, to say the least, Mr. Leslie. Absolutely. This is going to be a really tough match for Sixo from this point. He does have to come back, but of all the decks, I think Sixo, if Sixo could pick a deck that he needs to come back from behind with, for him, it would really be Patron. It's such a strong deck for him. He was strong with the original Patron. And we see the Dread Chorus there. It's pretty clear that it is Patron. And the patron comes in as well, so there you go. Just in case there were any doubts. Yes. It's nice when the card that the deck is named after pops out just to let you know what's up. Yeah. Sixo was one of the very best players in the world at the original uh, Warsong Charging patron. Yep. He then, as soon as that was nerfed, uh, uh, didn't even spend any time complaining about it. Like yeah, literally people... within hours he'd built the new patron that was like oh, 27 cards to what yeah. you see now. Uh, it's almost exactly as we now see it, I, yeah. you know. Just bypass the slide, the slide dig it yourself there. So it was, uh, he didn't spend any time complaining about the patron nerf and just got on with uh, building a new deck. But, you know, teach their own. Anyway, going back to Hearthstone <laughs> right now. How was the timing? Yeah, How was the timing? Was the pause long enough there, Calvin? It was just about, just about. Okay. But, you know, you're, so you're another player who is uh, a big proponent of the original patron, not necessarily yes. playing as much of the old patron. We have played a lot of this, of this new patron, sorry. Uh, how does it line up against Freeze Mage? Uh, well, there are many, many decisions that you have to make as to what your strategy is, and it's dependent on the the out the makeup of your deck. Sorry, uh, if you have, for example, Finley Mergleton in your deck, which some patrons do, if you have Corcron Elite, which normally goes together in that same kind of list, you're playing a more tempo focused patron deck. In which case, your strategy is most often to actually try and tempo the mage out of the game and pop Ice Block twice and win the game that way. Uh, if you're playing a, a slower list, which it looks like what Sixo has here with the Sludge Belcher, you're going to be more on the plan of fatigue, I believe. Um, we will identify that as soon as we have the turn where Sixo has the choice to play the Armorsmith as to which strategy he's going for. If he plays the Armorsmith out on the board, it's more likely he's going for the tempo play. He keeps it in his hand, that suggests that he's going to go down the fatigue line and just try and generate a million armor with the armor smiths later in the game. Yep, so a decent board here for Sixo, protecting the Acolyte of Pain with the Dread Corsair. And Joe Dude, just going to go for a ping here, doesn't want to set up the Acolyte because of the trade with the Dread Corsair. So the Dread Corsair doing a lot here for Sixo and has well, the second one. There we go, Armorsmith hits the board. It is alongside two other minions here, so there's a decent chance it gets to generate some armor, but looks like he is going for the tempo play because he's played his Armorsmith into a potential Frost Nova Doomsayer turn here, which would net him exactly zero armor. Yeah, I mean, the Patron Warrior matchup is slightly different from the Control Warrior matchup, obviously, but the conventional wisdom about Warrior versus Freeze Mage does still apply. And if you're able to build up enough armor to just stay out of range of your opponent's resources, they can't ever kill you. Right. Um, it, there, there are ways to defeat that strategy. If you manage to get an insane Emperor Archmage hand, you can fill your hand with just too much total damage to be it for, to, for anything to heal out of that isn't just a card. Yeah, Fre Freeze Mage has a finite amount of damage unless it cheats enough in through Archmage Antonidas. Correct. Um, but yes, it looks very much like Sixo is on the tempo plan here. Um, and I guess he's just reacting to his hand. He got a very strong tempo draw with the two Dread Corsairs, the Belcher, the Weapon. So he's been able to really push this sort of board presence early on. And honestly, that Armorsmith is still there and demanding an answer. So if something like Blizzard was to come out here or any, any AoE, it's still going to net him a decent amount of armor. So he's in a kind of nice halfway house situation where he's, he's relatively far along the line of both strategies here. He has a lot of pressure. He's above 30 health. He has an Armorsmith in play that will net him more. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. You know, I, I talked in the last game about how the turns 5, 6, and 7 for the Freeze Mage are so important. If you can get past the turn 5 as a warrior with an Armorsmith on the board, actually you really neuter the turn 6 and 7 AoE options. Particularly in this situation, I mean, you can, he can Blizzard, he has one in hand. What's it going to do? Well, it'll draw it'll draw 6 of a card, it'll get 6 of 4 armor, and leave him 2 minions on the board. Yeah, the, 
There you go, the Armor frostbolt Smith. of the Armor Smith. Armor Smith eating a frostbolt. I mean, sure, if you look at that, like, okay, it's prevented a bunch of armor gain, but that is an Ice Lance activator and three damage in itself that's thrown at the Armor Smith. Plus, the Armor Smith gains one extra armor by that interaction in itself. So, that is already a four damage swing, plus the factor of the Ice Lance is now being harder to activate. So even in that situation where the Armorsmith gets dealt with relatively quickly, like you can see the threat of that card in this matchup. And behind two taunts, Frothing Berserker, not a bad tempo option either. But you do have to be a little bit concerned of Flame Strike now with no Armorsmith on the board. Sure, but uh, even if Flame Strike happens, again, you'll draw a card, you'll still have that Sludge Belcher in play to smash another three in next turn. Um, it's just an option about whether he decides to commit this second Dread Corsair. It looks like he's already ended the turn, so he's going to hold on to this second Dread Corsair as some form of refill in the late game, and also potentially as a cheap Battle Rage activator uh, to be able to fill his hand up if he draws into Battle Rages. Yeah, having that ability to play the cheap Dread Corsair, as you say, for Battle Rage, but also for potentially with the second Armorsmith later on, yeah. it's another target for that. So just having another utility minion in the deck, it's also another good reason to keep the Unstable Ghoul in hand rather than play that as well. You know, if you can play uh, Corsair, Ghoul, Armorsmith, Whirlwind in a turn later on, mm -hmm. that could be a pretty big swing for you. Yep. Battle Rage, another very um, polarizing card that's very defining of, of how you're playing the matchup. If you're on the Fatigue plan, you generally just try and draw one or, one or two cards with Battle Rage, just to make sure that you have those Executes and Armor Smiths in your hand soon enough to be able to execute the strategy. If you're going for the Tempo play, you just Battle Rage for as many damn cards as you can and just try and get your resources in your hand. So. Well, there's Slam. I don't think that's going to be any use for six. So he's just happy to armor up here. Yep. That is the problem, right? If you do freeze the warrior's board and the warrior just goes, okay, armor up, pass. Yep. Good turn that's... for me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's it's definitely a turn which gains the warrior something, yep. even though you've made them effectively pass the turn. But the the respect there from the jaw dude for the frothing berserker that was that was basically that o the only thing that frost nova was aimed at. He just didn't want to take that frothing damage if a whirlwind or something was to come out. Um, but now with no additional options, doesn't look like he wants to spend the blizzard here. He's going to go ahead and Emperor his hand. Two Forgotten Torches, Frostbolt, Ice Lance, Blood Mage, and Pyromance, uh, Pyroblast in hand, sorry. So that is a big fat old chunk of damage stacked up with that Alexstrasza as well. Yeah, the other thing that's really important that's been hit by the... I mean, everything in the hand is good that's been hit by the Thorison, but the, the Ice Block getting hit as well is yep. really good because that gives you the ability to play the second Ice Block when you're hitting those final damage turns, makes it a lot easier to play that ice block, ice block alongside your damage spells. Sure does. Uh, one ice block is in play at the moment. Again, not shown particularly clearly on the overlay. I think you can just see it kind of shining out, but that might just. I be think that's Medivh. I was going to say that's Medivh's eyes. I yeah. Think. Okay. Fair enough. Um, so the execute is drawn. He plays the slam on the unstable ghoul here. Has he found uh, the ice block pop here this quickly? Looks like he has. So he, whirl, he whirlwinds. Yeah, he whirlwinds. He slammed the ghoul so that the second whirlwind goes off. Oh, yeah, this is plenty of damage to push through. I was too busy looking at Medivh's eyes to be counting things like Ice Block pop here. Uh, that's only. Yeah, he still has another. He has an inner rage and yeah. another whirlwind in his hand. But he, oh, sure, yeah, yeah. He, has this covered. he has this covered by a long way. Yeah. No, I was just thinking because he didn't. He drew the inner Ow! Okay. If that was deliberate, six, though, you're a god because he found exactly 19 on that. Like that's um, if that was deliberate, six, oh, give that man an eyebrow. I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised. This is six, oh, on Patreon. Yeah. It's exactly the sort of thing that doesn't really surprise me, but it shows, it shows just how good a player six, oh, is quite, quite honestly. Just to be able to find that, to find the ice block pop in the first place, and then be able to do it at exactly one. Yeah. That Elven Archer would be a good card right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, Jordude is, uh, after his aggressive Emperor play on the previous turn, is now looking at his hand, which is stacked up with all the damage in the world that he could possibly need, but just doesn't have enough turns to... to wait, what? This is conceding the game, is it not? You're just going to Frostbolt that to kill it? I mean... How do you intend to win this game now, is my question. Right. If you're Alex in your is... own face. This is the the oldest wisdom in Hearthstone, right? It's yeah. playing to playing to survive, not playing to win. Yeah. And uh, in the end of the day, it doesn't matter because Gormash. But in in Jordu's defense, there, I'm not sure. Looking at that yeah. collection of cards in his hand, what the play to win was. There's a possibility there just wasn't one. So 
he uh, just put himself in the position, I guess, to survive more turns, which, as we talked about before in Last Hero Standing, is relevant because you get to see more cards from the, the winning deck. So it's going to be the Warlock for Jordud, right? That's yes. Left. Uh, any any indication of what Jordud's Warlock might be? Uh, none. None. Um, I believe I've seen him play both. Um so, yeah, I, I, I actually don't know. I'm not choosing not to reveal information here. I actually don't know what his lineup is. I'll get that out there right now. Um, but, yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see an aggressive um, Zoo deck or a, a control list. I think he's fully capable of playing both. After giving that disclaimer about quick last hero standing uh, games in the just before we started this series, this is our second series out of two that's gone to five games. Yep. And I think, uh, above anything, that says a lot about the the quality of the players that we have here in the tournament is the the talent pool even from the players like jardude who aren't that well known the talent is just so stacked yeah also what i will you know i kind of dismissed your statement beforehand when you were saying that the the meta is in a really healthy place right now i don't i don't necessarily agree with that what i will say is we're not in the position where there is one polarizing deck right now there isn't a miracle rogue there isn't a, a sunshine hunter there isn't a warsong patron there's none of those decks so in that sort of situation where the three O's are less likely because there isn't a super dominant deck, three two is actually going to be the most common outcome because when you put together a last hero standing lineup, you build it to go three two. That's your aim. Yeah. All right. Well, from the Jordan, it looks like I'm going to go on a limb and say this is the uh, the faceless combo Reno look. Looks we that way. See yep. the faceless. Yep. Uh, Arcane Golem or Leroy can be used as the, the activator. Obviously, Arcane Golem has the benefit of not being needed to Emperor your hand to activate the full combo, whereas Leroy adds the extra damage. So um, players tend to choose different things. Leroy is much more threatening against, say, an opposing uh, Reno Lock mirror matchup. You can threaten them from much further out, force them to Reno at what should be a fairly comfortable life total. Yeah, 20. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, but yeah, a lot of people do prefer to go with the Arcane Golem just because you know, you're know you not reliant on getting that hand with Emperor and the, at least one of the combo cards in it at the same time. We see our second refreshment vendor of the day, Sato. Yep. Thoughts on uh, Funnel Cakes? Uh, good card. It's one of those cards that kind of Reno has, has done well to bring into the metagame in a way because it's, it's a good card, but it suffers from Shredder Syndrome, i.e. it's not yeah. piloted Shredder, therefore you don't play it. Um, so when you're forced to make all these different decisions to force extra cards into a Highlander style deck, things like Refreshment Vendor just come out to play more often because you have to have those range of minions in your deck. Yeah, well we see things in Reno Log like Stalag and Fugin for example. Right. You know, yeah. and th those are good cards. Those are really difficult cards to deal with for a lot of decks, you know, yeah. that, to avoid and avoiding giving your opponent an 11-11. Uh, in this situation, with Reno Lock, it does just open up opportunities for, for those cards. And even things like Senjin, some people have been playing those in Reno, just cards that have fallen out of favor, as you say, because of Shredder. Blame Shredder for everything. Yeah, so back to Patron versus Reno Lock here. This is a matchup that I had a significant dispute with Mr. Uh, Jeffrey Trump Shi when we were casting the Onog tournament from PAX, where I believe this matchup to be about 50 50. Very, very winnable for the Patron Warrior. Trump believes Reno Lock, or at least the control version of Reno Lock, not necessarily the combo lock, to be as much as 80% favoured in this matchup. Um, so I immediately said, all right, let's play first to 100 and work this out. And uh, Trump's response was, okay, if it's worth my time. <laughs> um, I'm assuming it hasn't happened yet. It has not, no. I think Trump probably has significantly greater financial resources than I do in terms of making things worth his time. So. Uh, I ended up backing out of that one. Yeah, I think if you end up losing the house to Trump and making a hard <laughs> store, your wife might not be best pleased. Yeah. Well, uh, back to the game. Twilight Drake in Reno Lock, not a card you always see, uh, because Reno Lock can be... It can be a deck that curves quite well, just because you're playing a solid assortment of cards, uh, and you wouldn't have necessarily the hand you would need for Twilight Drake, but... We do see, you know, we saw this Molten Giant in our first match. You do see the the strong elements of Handlock, like Twilight Drake, Molten Giant, and the former Handlock with the, the Leroy Faceless combo. Uh, they are options for Rio. 
Yep, very much so. Um, Twilight Drake, definitely one of the minions that you do want to get out early. It's classically really, really strong opener for the handlock as well. Just get that first minion on board, make your opponent kind of, um, you know, double take about whether they want to execute it or not. It's not one of the biggest things in the deck, but it's a thing that's going to represent a ton of value if it doesn't get executed. So there's always that decision that needs to be made. But Sixo has done exactly what you need to do in this matchup, which is as soon as possible, fill your hand up with as many options as possible and that double acolyte turn was exactly what he needed to do that so he now has all the plays in the world for a very very long time here uh, followed up by that grom when he needs it to to crush through the finishing damage um, but he doesn't quite have the option for the patron play this turn he has the inner rage and the patron but no whirlwind to go with it so it looks like he's just going to inner rage the acolyte continue cycling and probably double trade into the twilight drake with his weapon and the drake uh, weapon and the Acolyte, sorry, so ton of resources being cycled out here, has the Sludge Belcher to play down here, which is not a common inclusion, but in this situation, very, very nice to just fill out five mana and just place a nice minion on the board. Yep, double patron as well available for six. So if he starts picking up whirlwinds and activators, he has the potential to fill the board with patrons, have it cleared, and then refill again immediately, which is a pretty scary proposition. We see, is that that's all of the combo in hand now, right? The faceless arcane uh, power overwhelming one it is indeed he has the abusive in there as well which can for zero mana basically fill the gap between arcane golem and leroy in terms of damage so um really really nice hand for the combo here but he's just kind of missing the emperor if he does play one to get that combo down nice and cheap but again even for 10 mana he can play that full combo uh, arcane abusive uh, power overwhelming faceless so just needs to find some way to address the board right now and i guess he's going to give up on the total damage and just use the abusive board control here which makes a lot of sense and uh, just fill the curve out here with the low third. yeah i think that's fair enough i mean yes the the combo for 20 damage looks great yeah but you have to think how do i get to those turns how do i right. survive to get to turn 10 or turn 9 when i can play that and he's currently sitting with two taunts so i do need to do something proactive on the board yeah, for sure. But I will say that, you know, against Warrior, it's one of the matchups where you'd probably rather have the Leroy version because that extra damage is really relevant against a cl class with so much natural sustain with their hero power and the armor smith. So there was some consideration to holding on the extra damage with the abusive, but it was just a really nice play onto the board this turn, especially since you get to protect what looks like a pretty brutal whirlwind board with the Lothar. Oh, there's the Doctor Boom to further fill up Sixo's board. Even without patrons, you know, this is Patron Warrior, but even without patrons and Frothing Berserkers, Six is doing a very good job at controlling this board here. Yeah, this is uh, one and a half games of Patron Warrior we've seen so far, and we have yet to see a Grim Patron placed on the board. Well, so often in this new Patron deck, you do just win without the Patron, right? Yeah, very much. It's, it's pretty much just mid-range Warrior. It's just... Um... Like, the, the definition of a mid-range deck is kind of just efficient minions and with a power spike somewhere along the curve. So something on some turn that is more powerful than you'd expect. So Druid has that early with Innovate and they have it late with Combo. Patron has that with Patrons. They also have it with these insane Battle Rage terms. Um, you know, Mech Mage has Blast Mage, for example. You know, all these things that can happen that are just a little bit too powerful for the mana that they cost, but they're necessary to make mid-range work as a, as a concept. One damage to face with the Boomba. Unfortunately, it would have been hoping for something like the Lothab if you're 6 ill, but good Boombots for the Jar dude. Yep, but Siphon Soul, clunky card, does just end up passing initiative all the way back to 6 0 here, who can uh, now start to get in the mentality of, of making some patron plays here, I think. He's, he's yeah, well, he's. He's running out of cards in his hand, so he's probably going to want to set up the Death Spite this turn and then look to make a patron play on the following turn. You don't think that he wants to maybe trade the Boombot in and then if it doesn't kill the Lothab, he could Grim Patron, Taskmaster, Whirlwind? Patron, Taskmaster, Whirlwind this turn is definitely viable. It uh, because it clears the board as well. Right, it does. I don't hate that, actually. I like getting the Death Spite up, just for flexibility here, though, because it gives you so many options as to what to do over the next few turns. For example, you can do, like if you equip your Death Spite this turn and hit the Lothab, you can generate your first wave of patrons on the next turn without using the death spite and still have like that death spite sat there invested, able to generate the board of patrons afterwards. Uh, looks like he's going to go for the same play here, but he's going to keep that taskmaster in hand. I guess looking at the grom that he has to maximize that 12 damage, just use the slam instead, 
Still generates three patrons, still demands an AoE, but he keeps that Grom Taskmaster combo in hand. And no Hellfire. Yeah, I feel like that's... The development of the patrons here is definitely the play if the if the Boombot doesn't kill the Lotheb. I feel like that's definitely the strongest play. Since the Lotheb died to the Boombot, it's a little bit more up in the air, and I think there is, there is definitely merit to what you're saying about developing the Death Spite as well. Yeah. Um, but I, I wouldn't want to develop the Death Spite and necessarily leave the, the Lotheb up. Oh, makes sense. Um, Battle There's Rage, Battle Rage. seems to get drawn with incredible... Con As a man who's played a lot of Patron Warrior, the turn after you generate patrons, Battle Rage just seems to gravitate to the top of your deck. Like, just, oh, it's time for me, and just flies out into your hand. <laughs> it's insane. Well, I love your Hearthstone card voice there, Sasa. Yeah, that's, that's, great. that's Battle Rage's voice. The, the inanimate being that is Battle Rage. That's what it sounds like when it talks. Just in case you were wondering. Well, the Taskmaster, which was potentially being saved for the Grom. I don't know if Sixo played it before or after he saw the Inner Rage being drawn, mm -hmm. because definitely, you know, that gives you the option to play the Taskmaster now, since you've got the uh, the Grom with the Inner Rage now. But yeah, just clearing up the boards, clearing up that Emperor, which has hit the combo, so the combo is now only six mana. Yeah, but unfortunately, whether it's six mana or nine mana or ten mana or whatever in this situation, it's not enough damage. And the more pressing concern is this board of patrons. And this is just one of the ways I feel that patron can can win this matchup. And why I disagree so heavily with Trump is that you can win with tempo by just getting like an early minion draw and, and curving out. You can win by going all in on patrons, and they just don't have their one copy of Hellfire in their entire deck and yeah. in the game. Like, I mean, the the sad the sad thing about this situation is. What the Jordude's best out is, is to faceless the arcane and kill the two three threes. Uh, well, his best out is to tap into Hellfire. Or sure. If, if he can't tap into something better, yeah. In, in terms of what's in his hand right now, that's his only way to deal with this. But yeah. that again goes back to uh, playing to survive, not playing to win. So he's, he's just going to go for the healing. He's going to heal himself back up to twenty six, but we are looking at nine, eleven, fifty. 15, 25, 27 damage from 6 -0. Well, that's convenient. <laughs> well, exact lethal from 6 -0. You want to check your maths again, Sol, or are you, are you good? I'm good. I'm pretty sure this is 27. Yeah, I mean, 6 -0's determination is, uh, yeah, gives you the right answer, I think. Exact lethal for 6 -0 in another fairly nail-biting series, but, I mean, I did mention that if 6 -0 was going to come back with any deck, a, I would bet on it being patron, and B, I think he would like it to be patron. And we see him coming from 2-1 down to win the series 3-2 with the patron deck. 80% Reno lock, Ellie Giggle. That's, 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 <laughs> all, that's all I have to say. To that Subtle matter. knows more than Trump confirmed. <laughs> um, to be fair, it's, it's, it's a best of one sample size, and Trump was talking about the control Reno lock anyway, which plays much more yeah. um, a defensive game plan, but... Yep, uh, Ecop. Uh, Ecop? Why did I say Ecop? It's just chats full of Ecop Dan's game right now. I'm sorry. Um, it's sorry. Uh, who am I talking about? Sixo, that guy. It the picks, other up, German. picks up a win with the Patron Warrior, which is no Different great German. surprise. As you said, he is a very, very accomplished Patron Warrior player, able to clutch out that series, picking up two uh, very well navigated games against Freeze Mage and Reno Warrior. Uh, Reno Lock, sorry, which. Regardless of what you think of the matchups, are two difficult matchups to navigate, and he did it very well. We saw that exact one damage pop with all the whirlwinds, etc., in the um, in the freeze mage game, and we saw him recognizing the strategy against uh, Reno Lock extremely well. Focused on cycling early, spent the entire game with like eight or nine cards in his hand, and had all the resources he needed to just push home the pressure. So, very well played for six. So he will advance into our next round. And what is our next game coming up now, Callum? Well, just to say that Sixo will meet Kranich tomorrow in the okay. round of eight. That'll be our first game tomorrow, awesome. uh, which I'm really looking forward to. Now, that's okay. a that's a really good game. Yeah. Uh, and Sixo on Patreon, you got to think, Sixo on Patreon could be just about anyone and anything. So that's going to be super interesting. But yeah, we're going to go to a quick break now. When we come back, it's going to be Liquid Show and it's another of uh, Subtle's teammates, Ryzen. Maybe we'll get to know a little bit better. So we'll fill us in on who Ryzen is when we come back. Don't go anywhere. You're watching the Wombology Tournament with Calum and Salton. 